The title of this talk is The Map of Physics and the Missing Phase Equations of Quantum Mechanics, a talk I gave at the New England Fall 2017 APS meeting in uh, Kingston, Rhode Island. Uh, there were about, I don't know, 20, 25 folks in the room at uh, 9.30 in the morning. And I only got around to the map of physics uh, on the 10th slide because I had been so impressed with this very book, uh, Special Relativity and uh, Classical Field Theory by uh, the Theoretical Minimum by Suskin and Freeman because it made what I was working on so clear how I was trying to do things related to physics and yet somehow extending them. So it really became eight out of the first uh, 14 slides um, featured comments like this one. Uh, this is a quote from Minkowski made in 1908, very famous quote of his, that space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. And I really emphasize only a kind of union because it's not clear which one you should really use, right? I mean, who knows for sure? Well, actually, today, there's actually only one answer, and that is dif differential geometry. And it's the only answer because it's so darn successful. It's got things like scalars, contravariant tensors, covariant tensors, uh, metrics, all of which are covered in this book, uh, and also connections for when you start dealing with curved space-time. And you have this very famous uh, Minkowski space-time diagram with that light cone there. Well, what am I doing differently? Well, I use something called space-time numbers, which is a technical variation on quaternions. So for this lecture, we're just going to treat them as quaternions and say, well, yeah, but I don't know what those are. <laughs> well, you know what real numbers are. Numbers can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Complex numbers are pairs of numbers that can be added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided. And the next thing that comes up are quaternions, which have one real value and three imaginary values. And I think of this as being like time and three dimensions of space. So how does it change the light cone itself? Well, the light cone is still there. <laughs> what changes is that I now have algebraic relationships between all the various axes by using factors of i. Because i to the 0, well, that's kind of like not having any i at all. Those are real numbers. And then when you have i to the first power, that would be like um, the positive x. And when you get to i squared, you're the minus reals, and that would be minus time. That would be the past. And then when you get to i triple, i to the cube, that would be negative i, negative x. And even x and y have a relationship through the cross product. So what we now have is a situation where there's all this algebra possible without doing anything um, other than using space-time numbers, or sorry, quaternions. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, when special relativity was introduced, it meant that, you know, everything had to be rebuilt from the ground up and it was incredibly successful <laughs> and uh, people don't want to leave it but if you want to just use quaternions well i can't use co contravariant uh tensors i can't use covariant tensors i can't use those greek indices i can't use metrics i can't use connections and i'm going to try and just use things that are really quite simple i'm going to use things like conjugates and squares and not a lot beyond that. Okay, but, <laughs> however, we are not free to do anything. 
We like, we are constrained by the success of the older theory. Now, he, here he was talking about special relativity and Newtonian mechanics, but I'm thinking about what he described classical field theory. So what really goes into classical field theory? And the reason I like this book is because he gave such a darn clear answer. Uh, as a matter of fact, he wrote down these four ideas. Uh, the action principle, locality, Lorentz invariance, and gauge invariance. Now, which of these four ideas am I going to say is wrong? Well, by the previous slide, I've got to say none of them are wrong. <laughs> and instead, what happens when you work with quaternions is you can manipulate them and get the thing people want and then get some extra stuff. And I'm going to argue that that extra stuff is always a well-formed expression and we shouldn't just ignore it. And so we might get the, the action principle, but we're going to get other terms that we can apply uh, the principle of least action to and get expressions and investigate them. And as, when, when there's Lorentz invariant quantities, things that every inertial observers agree on, there are also Lorentz variant quantities. Oh, that's not a phrase people use very often, but I'll show you examples of things where they change and we understand exactly how they change. And it's not bad to have them around. And there's this issue of gauge invariance, which is enormously important for things like uh, electromagnetism. But then there are lots of things that uh, don't travel at the speed of light. They all need very different collections of gauges, and it might be nice to have things that actually do depend on gauge, just as long as they're not named photons. <laughs> So in this book, uh, it really emphasizes the importance of an action. And when I saw this, I saw M, hold it, is that a four vector sort of thingy? And I was like, no. Is d tau a kind of four vector thingy? And it was like, no. So what combination of four vectors would end up generating these terms? And what I realized was that if you write these out as quaternions and you just take the energy momentum one and multiply it by this differential uh, time uh, space thing, when you form that product, amazingly enough, the first term ends up being m d t, d tau. Now, this is the action for something that's just moving with absolutely nothing else ha happening <laughs> to it. It's the simplest one out there, and it's made out of this incredibly simple expression. It's like a three-line derivation, uh, because both E and P, uh, the energy and the mo uh, momentum, have a mass term. So they share the mass, and then the, that's dt d tau and dr d tau, and when you square uh, multiply those up, you end up with a d tau squared over d tau, or d tau, m d tau. It's, it's really kind of surprising <laughs> that it's that easy, but uh, that happens time and again uh, when I work with quaternions. And you also have these other terms. And have I really done too much work with them? No, I haven't. But they're well formed. There's nothing illegal or immoral about them. I'm not going in some seven or eight or ten dimensions. Uh, they're, I, they're worthy of investigation, and I certainly will be doing that in the uh, near to medium uh, term future. Okay. One, th one of the things that shows up all the time in special relativity is this interval, and it's an incredibly useful idea but there's something that bothers me about it. A, if you think about how much information goes into it, well, you need a dt, you need a dx, you need a dy, you need a dz. You also need a metric tensor, and that's got 10 parts. And then if you're dealing in curved space-time, you've got 10 nonlinear differential equations to solve, 
So that's like 24 pieces of information, and the end result is one piece of information. So why does that bother me? It bothers me because let's say we had four ob inertial observers, and they're all moving in different directions at different constant speeds, and they were all watching the same uh, pair of events, and they all get back to us and say, hey, this is what the interval was, and everybody agrees. I mean, that's how special relativity works. That's good. That's a good thing. What's a bad thing is that we can't tell how each of those observers move relative to each other if we're only given the interval back. So what happens with uh, space-time numbers um, when you square them in this kind of context is, of course, you get the Lorentz invariant interval. And you'll be able to say, hey, we all agree on that. That's great. But then you have this Lorentz variant space times time. And exactly how that varies between these uh, multiple observers will tell you exactly how one observer is moving relative to the other. And to me, that's just a good thing. <laughs> so I want to have my space times time terms. All right, so we're finally to the map of physics, uh, the title of the talk. Uh, this is actually based off of a YouTube video that I highly recommend you do a simple Google search for uh, by the Domain of Science. Uh, it's gotten over a million views. It's, it's really wonderful and clear, and I went ahead and bought the, uh, the map. Um, so I could put it up in my, my own office so I could say, hey, uh, I see how this, this is in that area of physics and at one time. Well, at the start of that video, he divided physics into three play, uh, areas, classical physics, relativistic physics, and quantum physics. And then he said, you know, underlying all of physics is mathematics. And that raises the question, what mathematics divides physics into these three separate areas? And when I thought about it from a perspective of, of writing expressions using quaternions, I said, I don't even agree with his Venn diagram. I think of physics as being classical physics and relativistic physics, that that covers like everything, that division. And then you, on top of that, you have whether an expression has to do with quantum mechanics or it doesn't. So how am I going to do my map using math? All right. So I'm going to write all expressions using the space-time numbers. All right. And then in if that expression has a constant in it of any sort, like a zero or one sort of thing, that's going to be what classical physics is about, that expression. It's going to be a relativistic equation if time and space are always treated on similar terms. Nobody's constant in there. And then an equation that's going to be about quantum mechanics if a norm is required to connect to the data. And otherwise, it's not about quantum mechanics. And that's it for the rules. So if we look at the classical side, well, nothing could be more classical than Newton's law. And we see why it is the most classical. We see three zeros in there, um, a zero for when you have a time operator uh, and no space operator. And then you've got another time operator and it's no space operator, and then you act on space without having time in there. And this is a change in time of momentum. And when you use the product rule, you end up then with MA, and you end up with this other term that, as far as I can tell, isn't used for anything, <laughs> which strikes me as remarkable. How can you have a term this simple and nature decides never ever to use it. I don't know. It's uh, it's an open mystery to me, uh, but I'm still curious about this product rule term.
So now, then there is the relativistic side. And uh, I divide that into speedy R, SR, special relativity, <laughs> and gravity relativity, GR. So special relativity is when you have two inertial observers and they observe the same pair of events and they calculate the interval and they say, hey, we agree upon that. They also end up disagreeing about the space times time. And I am in the process of developing a new approach to gravity, which says if you now have two non-inertial observers and they're at, say, different heights in a gravitational field, that they will agree exactly to their space times time, that green value, and they will disagree about the interval. Now, this is actually approximately true for general relativity. It's just not exact. So there are lots of things to uh, have to be ironed out about that as a proposal, but it certainly would be nice if the two relativistic theories were just kind of like different uh, agreements uh, made about different terms in the exact same sort of square. And I also included this four derivative of a four potential, because that sounds very simple and straightforward. And when you do it, you end up getting uh, two terms, uh, the two fields of electromagnetism. And it's like, <laughs> that seems ridiculously uh, fortunate. I wasn't doing electromagnetism. I was taking the simplest four derivative of a four potential with quaternions and boom, there are the two most important fields, in, the key fields in, in electromagnetism. Really amazing. Oh, and there's another field. There's a gauge term. Now, if I have to get rid of that, like if I'm dealing with Maxwell and then photons, it's easy enough to do algebraically. But there are a lot of charged particles. In fact, every charged particle <laughs> where they have to have uh, a gauge field, I think. Well, maybe I shouldn't s s go that far out, but uh, where, you know, they don't travel at the speed of light. Having a gauge might just be a very good thing and having quite a bit of flexibility might be a good thing because the, the masses for charged particles are all over the place and we, we really need to uh, break gauge symmetry uh, a whole bunch of different ways to explain all these different charged particles uh, with, uh, with different masses that are out there. So these equations I've discussed so far, they are not quantum mechanics because I haven't had to take the norm of anything. And that's what I am claiming is at, underlies uh, what is quantum mechanics. So what would be examples of quantum mechanics? Well, there'd be classical quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, uh, where if you write it out in terms of um, these uh, quaternion operators, one of them's got a one right in the front of it. You know, uh, you don't take uh, two time derivatives. You only take one, and that's enough to say it's classical. So when does it become quantum mechanical? Well, usually people write out the Schrodinger uh, equation as an amplitude, a complex valued amplitude. But in order to connect it to data, you actually have to take the norm. You have to take the conjugate of it, multiply it by itself, and that's when you can start to connect it to data. For a relativistic case, you've got the Klein-Gordon equation, and there everybody gets filled, all these terms filled in, and there again, they usually write out the amplitude and knowing full well that they're going to have to take the conjugate and multiply it by itself in order to connect to experiment. And you say, yeah, but that's not true of like the, um, the uncertainty principle unless you look into the derivation of the uncertainty principle, in which case uh, <laughs> that, that proof actually you have to take a norm uh, right, right in the middle of it. So I, I should say I'm, I am wearing my, I wore my t-shirt 
this this shirt really does incorporate a lot of the ideas that I, I'm I'm putting forth uh, as far as coming up with a new map and a, a whole new perspective on how to do um, space-time mathematical physics. Thank you very much.